All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem fulfills the prophecy of Zechariah as the Holy Spirit had inspired the evangelist Matthew to confess. To fulfill means, or can also mean, to complete. This is one of the nine times that Matthew spoke of events of Christ's life fulfilling or completing the Old Testament. This is in part what Jesus meant when he said, all scriptures testify of me. According to Zechariah and all the prophets and Matthew and the other evangelists, Jesus is the sum and circumference of the Bible. So every Christian preacher is also given to speak to the daughter of Zion, the Holy Christian Church, in the same way as the prophet and the evangelist. Just like those pilgrims and faithful residents in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, you too hunger, thirst, and yearn for your redemption the forgiveness of your sins. So Zechariah's prophetic promise is true for you as it is for them. Behold, your king is coming to you. Today I'd like to consider two parts here. First, what does it mean that he is your king? And second, what does it mean that he is lowly, sitting on a donkey? First, that he is king. Rightly here you probably hear the word Christ. Because kings, of course, were the anointed ones. The Greek translation of the Hebrew word designated for the Messiah is Christ. Both Messiah and Christ mean anointed one. Or you might say the crowned one or the king. Behold, your king, your anointed, comes to you. Is another way of saying that the Lord, for whom God has chosen by his prophets, is coming. And as the prophet said, Isaiah... The government would rest upon his shoulders, and his kingdom would be established and upheld with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. When those people shouted on the Mount of Olives, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel, this was a tribute, a confession of the Messiah, of our God. And so we, the church, offer the same tribute to her Lord on this first Sunday in Advent. The lessons for this Sunday say the same thing. Say our own Hosanna. Jesus is the Christ, God's Messiah, the promised one who would come, our King, indeed the sovereign of the whole world. So it is no accident that, as we'll hear in a few weeks, Jesus was born of the lineage of David, born of royal blood. And yet he wasn't simply just a descendant of royalty entitled to a crown. He himself says to the Pharisees that even David called him Lord. This king is different, existing in the time of David, yes, even before Abraham. And he is Lord over all. All of the previous history had its goal in him and for him. And since humankind has risen in defiance of God, God had planned it this way. The only possible way of salvation for his children is in Christ. So in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born to redeem those under the law. All of this long preparation of Israel had its meaning only because it pointed forward and prepared the way for Christ. And as he is your king, then you are also his royal subjects. This is really the heart of the gospel. To be forgiven means to be restored, to dwell in Christ's presence. Jesus comes to do this, to save you, make you his own, and give you to live under his kingdom. Or, as you just said in the Nicene Creed, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven. Or, as the apostle testifies, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be made equal with God, 
but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being in the, found in the appearance of, of, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. There's that other word, lowly or humble. The evangelists did say, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey. Now, a lot of ink has been spilled on the donkey and the colt and how this could be, and it is significant, but today I want to focus on that word lowly or humble, because I think that's the point. Jesus voluntarily remain, refrains from the glory that belonged to him as Lord of the universe. His humility is not simply in becoming man, for mankind was and is made in God's image, the apex of creation. Very good. No, his humility is in becoming a lowly man, enduring what was far beneath his majesty. He exposed himself to all kinds of malice, envy, slander, hatred, jealousy, insults, suffering, misery, pain, and ultimately death for you and for your salvation. But there is something curious here that the evangelist Matthew did. He actually made a word substitution when he quoted from the prophet. He substituted the word lowly or humble for what Zechariah originally said was just or righteous. Again, he substituted lowly humble for what Zechariah had foreseen as righteous and just. He's doing this to make a heavy theological assertion. You who know the prophet would recognize that he had made that change. He's trying to tell you something. The expectation from the coming king, the Messiah, the Christ, is that what he would be doing, saying, or even thinking about would be good, right, and true. That is righteous and just. He would be the epitome of the righteous and just man, like David or Solomon, but even better. He would judge with equity. He would speak with wisdom. He would be the best of rulers. But again, Matthew substituted the word there for humble and lowly. What I, want, I think he wants us to see is that Jesus is not just just or right, especially not simply in man's eyes. In our eyes, j true justice is being good little boys and girls, following all the rules. Righteousness is like doing the right thing or doing the thing, be it flying flags, posting memes, signaling all your virtue, behaving as our culture or this world expects of us. We do what is right in our own eyes, and we expect others to do the same. We even call just what, well, according to God's word, is unjust. Rights that God actually has forbidden. Jesus calls this the blind leading the blind. And our righteousness and our ideas of justice will never get you where you want to be, that is, in the Father's good graces. It will only lead you and those around you into the pit. So if Jesus had done what was just, righteous, wise, in our socially acceptable eyes of justice, and what is right in our own eyes, he would never have ridden into Jerusalem as he did, in humility. He would have amassed a fighting force in Galilee and st stormed to the capital with a large-scale coup against those tyrants or and also the spiritual tyrants of the false religion in the temple. He would have used swords and clubs and commanded his followers to fight. He would have overthrown them with physical force. And he would have strong words, too, to accuse and condemn and execute all who stood in his way in the way of righteousness and justice. It is right and just, but it's what we call civil righteousness, not the kind of righteousness that the law of God demands. It's a different kind of righteousness. And so what Matthew does by saying he rides in lowly instead of righteous is he's giving us a bold correction to what we think is righteous or just. 
Your King Jesus does not come to condemn sinful people and throw them into hell. That's Moses who comes to judge and accuse of sin. So also the devil comes to accuse, judge, and kill. But your King Jesus does not come to condemn, but to help, to redeem from sin, to pardon, and to forgive. That is how we should see him, how he wants to be known by us. That's what it means to be truly righteous. As he told his cousin John, from his baptism unto his cross, resurrection and ascension, everything that Jesus said and did was to fulfill all righteousness. Not our idea of righteousness, but the righteousness that is given to us as a gift, forgiveness of sins. That's what Jeremiah was directing us to confess, that Jesus is your righteousness. He has fulfilled or completed the law, and our righteousness is in him. As we confess at Augsburg, our churches teach that people cannot be justified before God by their own strength, merits, or works. People are freely justified that is, made righteous for Christ's sake through faith. When they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, his alone. So, by his death, Christ made satisfaction for our sins, and God counts this faith for righteousness in his sight. So when we say, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous or just, or if you prefer, in the way of Matthew, lowly or humble, we're saying something pretty profound. The Christian righteousness is the faith that believes that sins are forgiven freely for Christ's sake. This is what Jesus is about getting for you when he rode into Jerusalem that Palm Sunday. And this is the righteousness he gives to you today and always as he rides here into his little Zion this faithful new Jerusalem. He comes to help, redeem, pardon, and forgive you. He gives you his righteousness under the water, bread, and wine to the word of promise. He's just as humble and lowly today as he was in that prophetic vision of Zechariah and its inspired fulfillment seen by St. Matthew. In humility, he is just and righteous forgiving your sins. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen.